Awesome. Hey, so listen, um, we are super excited that you are here today. If you're a guest, we hope that you felt welcomed by our hospitality team and, and you, you feel like this is a place where it's uh, safe and also a place where you can engage uh, some of these uh, life questions that you might be having. And so maybe you just came and you happened to stumble upon us because this is your first time in Delray, or maybe you're familiar with the series that we're in right now. We're in a series uh, called What About? And um, we're looking at these six different areas um, that really, from what the research say, uh, at least five of them, specifically from the research, uh, Barna uh, did, a, did a study. Uh, the research says that these are some of the reasons why people, specifically millennials, are no longer in church anymore, while they've just kind of said, thanks, but no thanks. Um, and, and so we've been, what we've, the attempt has been to not answer these questions, but to give each of these questions attention. Because I think w sometimes uh, when, when we come and say, hey, we have all the answers, that was actually part of the, the reason why it's like, hey, man, this is, this is what's distancing me. Now, we believe that we operate from truth, and we believe that there is absolute truth. But our approach to that is we want to we wanna, um, be able to engage you. We want to be able to meet you where you are, explore and value you your perspective, while at the same time offering you the biblical perspective, offering you what God says about the very issue that may have kept you away for a while. We want to do it in a loving way like we see Jesus doing it throughout his ministry here. And so that's the purpose of this. Um, so you might be here because, hey, this is a topic that you wanted to explore. We've done what about God in science? What about God in culture? What about God in meaning? Uh, and today we're going to be looking at what about God in sex? What about God in and sex. And so I know for um, many of us here today, this can be uh, a, a difficult topic. This can be a topic that uh, potentially brings with it a lot of pain, um, a lot of brokenness and, and shame. And, and we want to be sensitive to that. First of all, we want to say thank you that you're here. If you actually came and you brought that in and you kind of knew what was happening, uh, and, and yet you still were willing to um, come and explore what, what the scriptures have to say about this particular topic. And I just want to say thanks for, for trusting us with that. And, and we're going to um, do as best we can to be truthful to the word of God and very sensitive uh, and, and, and loving to where you may be in your, in your journey. Um, and so and if, and if you just kind of came and you're like, wow, what about God and sex? Maybe you're like amped that that was a topic today. You're like, yes, I like church again. Then you're welcome too. You're totally welcome too. Um, so I, I'm, I'm trusting that we're going to have all sorts of different um, perspectives here. And, and so what we want to do uh, is just walk through this like we have every other uh, particular topic, asking God's spirit to be our lead and our guide. And one of the things, I'm just going to like say it from the front, because sometimes, you know, when you say something from the front, it reminds you of, of what you think is going to happen. I feel like God has been pressing upon me this week in, in preparing for this, that there that there's going to be some healing. I don't know who that's for or what that exactly means for you, but uh, I know that Jesus is a healer and he loves to heal people. And so if you have some pain and brokenness and, and heartache that uh, maybe has never been touched or healed before, um, I'm just believing that that's going to happen for us today. Okay, so uh, that's, that's what we're going to be looking for today as we walk through the scriptures and we see what about God and uh, sex. It's an important and imperative topic that we handle, as I believe all of these are, because if, if you look at the, the research that's been put out again by Barna, uh, there's what we have called a young exodus happening. We've been talking about this a little bit every week where the, the numbers say that basically six in ten uh, of, our, of our youth will no longer uh, be with us in, in uh, a faith environment anymore. Like that's, that's how quickly they're leaving um, the church. They call it a young exodus. And uh, we have a 3% identified uh, rate of people who are following Jesus in South Florida by another study. And so we're calling the 97% the sort of the forgotten majority, I think sometimes within Christian circles. Sometimes we, we, we are really focused and, and amped up about the 3%, but we forget the 97%. And I don't mean all of us and all the time, but I mean even in, sometimes in my preaching, like I'm really ready to preach to the 3%. Um, and it's just easier. But this series has really uh, been a blessing to me because it's pushed me out into some areas where 
you know, I'm, I don't necessarily normally think or, or hang out in because it's given me that perspective of like, what about the 97%? Um, even if they're not here today, those are the people that we're going to be in conversation and relationship with. So how can we equip one another to go out there and be lovingly uh, relevant with Jesus? And so that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to be looking at. We, this is one of our... Um, you, we've, we have a strategy this year of accomplishing some what we call radical gospel renewal, and, and one of the strategic efforts is reimagining evangelism. So that's what this series is all about. How can we kind of reimagine uh, how the gospel is shared? So I'm going to pray, and then, uh, and then we're going to hop in. Father, you love what's going to happen today. You love it. You're committed to it. And so I pray that you would fill us with your spirit and that you would touch those who are here, that those who watch online, that those who will see later in the week. God, and you would bring any healing that might need to occur, that you would bring a new hope, and um, Father, that you would refresh our hearts in Jesus through all this. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, awesome. So, um, one, of the, one of the kind of comments about the, <clears throat> from, from the research was, it seems as though when the church handles um, issues of sex, that there is uh, a judgmental tone and a simplistic tone. Judgmental and simplistic. And so um, just giving you an idea of like, that's what the research says about what some of uh, at least millennials are thinking about the church. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to walk through and say, hey, like, what, is the, what does the Bible say about sex? Like, what is God's design for sex? And, um, and how can we share that in an invitational uh, way and, and maybe invite you into something that you've never considered before. And so uh, the, fir the first place we're going to start is asking this question is, what are we famous for as a church? Not the Avenue Church, but, but in church history, what are some of the things that we're famous for as it comes to this topic of sex? One of them is that we don't talk about it a lot. <laughs> we're like silent. It's like, it's like, I'm not sure why, but if you've been in church for a while, you probably can, like, on one hand, remember the times there was a sermon on sex. It was like the four times you amen something. Okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe. So, so one, of the, one of the things that we're famous for is, is we don't really talk about it a lot. I feel like, I feel like that's tragic. I feel like that's tragic. Um, it's not only tragic because I, I think you have to understand this is, you know, we, I just finished a, a, a walk through this experience with, with generosity um, and uh, did kind of like a retreat type thing. And um, in, in the midst of that retreat, as they were talking about generosity, this is not, generosity is not what God wants from us, they said. It's what God wants for us. And I think as it comes to like, like sex in this topic, this is, this is what God wants for us. Like, like this, there's such great beauty in this issue. And um, we're going to see what the scriptures have to say about it. But one of the things we're famous for is we don't talk about it a ton. One of the things that we're famous for, um, and I think that that might be true of Christian homes too. It might be true of Christian homes too. So, so in order to break that stereotype, I had to start in my home, right? So this is cool. I, had, I was having this conversation. We, we were having dinner in my my. 16-year-old daughter was there, and my wife, um, who's, you know, older than 16, but not quite 16, you know, she was there just since we're naming ages, and I was there, and so we were just kind of having fun with it, because, because we like to talk about sex, and we like to talk about sex when it's serious, we like to talk about sex when it's painful, we like to talk about sex when it's, when it's joyful, like, we, the more we talk about it, the more it becomes like an issue that, like, must be important to the heart of God, and, and it's not something like that's taboo or off the table, so I just really, um, like, lovingly and, and, and kindly told my wife, that since I'm going to be preaching on, on this topic, you know, it, it may be that, um, you know, like, babe, uh, well, I don't know if I should say this right now. I'm like bidding getting convicted. Like, I maybe should stop this story right now. I don't know where everyone's coming from, so I'm just going to stop this story. My wife hates it when I do that, by the way. I'll be like, oh my goodness, did I tell you this? And then midway through, I'll be like, I feel like that's gossipy. I can't say that. And she'll be like, really? You're going to do that to me? So I'm going to do that to you because I just felt like the Lord wanted me to stop that story. I'm sorry. Maybe if I get freedom to tell it, I'll tell it later in the sermon. <laughs> Come on. 
I'm just trying to be careful because I know there's people here where this is a hard topic. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna err on that side. Um, so what are some of the things we're famous for? We're famous for not talking about it. Um, we're famous for um, con- condemnation. It seems like this is, a, this is an area where we're pretty good at um, throwing some stones. Like we're, it's like we're quick. We're, we're like quick to the trigger. On some things, we're not so quick. It's like gossip. It's like slow trigger. Maybe you should like, maybe I should hold my, my buddy accountable for his gossipy attitude. Or maybe I should, you know, he's always complaining about his wife. Slow to the trigger. But, but like if there's a hint of sexual sin, it's like, well, boom, I got you. Like, I know I get to shoot you on that one. I, th- I think we're quick. We're, we're kind of, we've kind of been famous on condemnation. And, and, and it seems like everyone knows what we're against. Um, not everyone knows what we're for, but everyone, everyone knows what we're against. I feel like we're famous for failure. The church has failed here. Like, we have leaders who have failed sexually over and over again. And as a leader in the church, as one of those who has failed, um, let me just apologize for the failure where, where we were supposed to, especially men, I feel like a lot, of, a lot of the brokenness in our world today, and especially in this area, is men behaving poorly. And let me just say, as a leader in the church, I'm sorry for the leadership of the church and how we've failed you. Please forgive us and help us to do better. Um, and, I, and I feel like, um, as, as I mentioned before, we're, we're famous for elevating. I feel like this is an area where, we're, where we sometimes elevate this over other stuff. And it's like, um, seems, seems disproportionate a bit. At least that's kind of what we're famous for. And so, um, yeah, today's an invitation to walk with us and, and see what God has to say about that. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 1. And um, we're going to be walking through. This is going to be kind of our anchor verse, and then we're going to hit a couple of other verses. You should have them on your outline there. I would encourage you, when, when I give you verses on your outline, please um, go home and, and read the chapter with, with, with where the verse is found. So if it's like Genesis 1.27, go home and read Genesis 1. Read, it, read the whole chapter. We don't have time to break down all of the chapter, and I'm not trying to helicopter verses to make them say what I want. But for time's sake... I'm trying to walk you through the biblical perspective of this, but I feel like the Spirit um, you know, might be able to say some other things to you when you get alone with him and read the whole chapter and see them in context. But Genesis 1, um, 27 and 28 uh, gives us a picture of um, what God has to, has to say about sex and then leads us into some other things. And so um, it says this, So God created man in his own image. So I underline the stuff here that you're going to see on the screen. Um, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so um, there's a couple of things here that uh, are important as it pertains to um, God and, and what about God and sex? And so um, one of these things, is this, this comes back to what's called the Imago Dei, the fact that we are created in God's image. And, and we can learn a lot here from, from this particular passage. And one of the things that we can learn is that in, in the creation of, of man and woman, God created us in his image, okay? And so that's kind of what kicks off the passage here. And so what that means is that we're supposed to look like God to some degree in, in our lives. And, and we're we're supposed to um, be like God to some degree. Now, now, because we're not perfect and there's a brokenness to, to all of us, that's not full. The, like the image is, is shattered. But yet the, the creation design still remains. So the fact that you and I are created in God's image means that um, there's, there's a significant parts of our lives that are supposed to resemble the one who created us. So if you saw my son and you're like, oh man, that kid is the spitting image of you, what, what it would mean is he, he kind of looks like me. You can tell he's my boy because of his image. And what this verse is telling us is that um, there, there should be something about your life that when people look at it, you can be like, oh, I, I know who's, who you belong to. I know who your dad is. And that's what it means that we're created in his image. And uh, there's more to that. But in, in this particular case, so, so that's how we're created. 
And then it says that God blesses them, that um, God shows his favor upon them. And so there's creation, they're like God, um, and, then, and then there's like a special blessing that God puts on. It's like God puts his favor, his, it's, it's almost as if um, the scene would be he puts his hands on them and imparts to them um, something from his heart, something special. And then what does God tell them to do? like directly after he gives them like a special piece of his heart, after he blesses them, after God like gives them a benediction and kind of sends them out, what's the first thing he tells them to do? Well, so we, we can just, well, I'll translate that for you. Um, have sex. Okay, that's, that's what the Hebrew doesn't say, but it's just it's what the passage says. Be fruitful and multiply. And so we see God blesses them, and then what does he say? Go, go, go ahead, enjoy, go, enjoy one another. Be fruitful and multiply. Have children fill the earth. Interesting, and, and we don't need to belabor this too much, but I think it's important to note that right after the blessing of God, right after God blesses them with like his very own heart, the very first thing he tells them to do is to go be with one another to go have sex and begin to populate the earth. Um, I think there's a lot of implications that we can see here. And one of the, the one, the main driving one is that sex is a gift. Sex is a gift. If it comes that close to the blessing of God, it comes right after the blessing, we have to begin to understand that God designed and, and has intentions for sex to be a gift. Now, I understand that that gift has been misused and abused and been hurtful in many ways throughout history. But what we're going to do today is take a look at the, the intent, the original intent of why God gave us sex. And one of the first things that we can see from this Genesis chapter one is that sex was intended and is still intended to be a gift. Now, this is a story I can tell about. My, my daughter, and it doesn't involve my wife. So when she turned 16, my daughter kind of got a car. I don't know if you've ever kind of gotten a car before, but she got, um, I had an old car, and then it became her new car because we kind of got another car for the family, okay? So it was like dominoes. Like one more car got added in, and then that hit that domino. And so all of a sudden now my 16-year-old had my older car. And uh, it was a gift to her. So, so she was super amped. I don't know if you were 16 and you got a car. I was 16 and I got a car, and I was super amped. And so now my daughter, well, she was 16 and she got a car. Now, to, to be clear, it was older and, like, and, and it had been used a little bit. I did clean it out, I think, before I gave it to her. But like she got a gift from her dad. And when I gave her that gift, it was from her mom and dad. When, I, when, when we gave her that gift, she was pretty amped about it. But there were, specific, um, there were some specific usages of that gift. It wasn't a gift that she now had ownership to use however she wanted. It was a gift that was still connected to the giver. And as she used it in accordance with the design that I gave it to her, it actually brings pleasure to both of us. Anytime she uses that gift, which she hasn't, to my knowledge, <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but anytime she uses that gift outside of how I designed for her to use that gift, well, that's gonna bring heartache to the both of us. One of the reasons that she has that gift is because we have a family now of six, and we have, I don't know if you can relate to this, but in the morning, our drop-off it looks like, um, what's that game where you do the things in t uh, Twister? That's kind of what our drop-off looks like. We've got people going this way, we've got people going that way. And so the fact that she now has a car, she's like our own personal Uber, and it's awesome. <laughs> it's so awesome, and she's super cheap, right? Way cheaper. All we, we don't even have to push the app. We just have to be like, Caroline. And, and so one of, the, one of her usages of that particular gift is, is that it would, it would serve us, it would serve our family causes. And so she knows that there are some specific usages of that gift that go along with it. Another use of that gift is just that, like, I love my daughter, and if she is, she is actually ready to enjoy that type of freedom, and I love for her to be free and to, like, you know, be able to go. And she wants to go see the sunrise. 
go see the sunrise. She wants to be able to go grab this, Chick-fil-A. She wants to go here. She wants to go, hey, go for it. Like, just go and you want to join, go enjoy your friends. So there's, there's a pleasure side to the gift, but there's also a really practical side to the gift. But as, as I said before, as soon as she begins to use the gift outside of the way it was designed to be used by the person who gave it, as soon as she starts to think she actually owns it and it's not a gift anymore, things are going to break down. So what are some of the functions of the gift? What is it that God wants from us as it pertains to the gift? And so uh, if you're taking notes, you'll see this in your, in your outline here. We go through a couple of them. This isn't entirety, right? You know, I've got 23 minutes and 54 seconds left. So this isn't the entirety of, of, of uh, the theology of sex, but it's a pretty, I think, decent overview. And, and so um, one of the Again, not in any particular order, but one of the um, usages of the gift is it's the gift of procreation. It's the gift of procreation. And so in Genesis 1.28, we see that there is a call to be fruitful and multiply, as we already looked at. And so this is how um, life is uh, not only um, continued, but sustained. It's like this is, this is how we continue humanity. There is a function to sex that enables humanity to continue. So it's a pretty important usage right there, that like, you would see it be something where, where life comes from that. Now, I understand that not everyone can have children. And I understand that you know, that's not everyone's story and things like that. That doesn't mean you're misusing the gift. It, in our world, there's different reasons and cases for that. There's different, you know, in the brokenness of, of like when sin entered the world, it broke stuff down. And, and sometimes like people who deeply desire children can't have children um, through this particular way. And, and so, um, again, that doesn't mean you're, you're, you're misusing the gift. But, it, but when we look at the original intent of it, man, that's, that's front and center to, to why God gave us this gift. It's one of the ways that we can enjoy this gift is by seeing life come from it. And what I love about um, this gift, when we think about when God gives a gift, when God gives a gift, um, it's not only from the heart of God, but it says something about the heart of God. So when God gives a gift, it's not only from his heart, but it also says something about his heart. So as we apply that to our sexuality, well, it says something about God when we are enjoying sex in the proper context. And it also says something that comes from God. So it's, it's kind of like when, when you think of the topic of sex and you think about how the Bible has designed it, as you see this played out in a, in a really beautiful and obedient way, you learn more about God as people enjoy the gift the way he intended it. Um, one of the things that it says about God is that our God is a God of life. Our God is a God of life. You can learn about God from everything. It actually all points back to Jesus. All of life points back to Jesus. That's the biblical perspective. And so when we look at sex, we see that this is the God of life fulfilled most through the life that Jesus brings us. So our babies, when we have babies, when we have sex and have babies and we celebrate that, that's actually celebrating the God of life that ultimately, every baby ultimately points to the life that Jesus can fulfill and bring. Um, the second thing that we see is that it's the gift of intimacy. And when we uh, are enjoying sex in this um, context, it's the gift of intimacy. And it says uh, in Genesis 2, and the man and his wife were naked and not ashamed. So one of the first things that we have to understand here is the context in which sex was given. So the context from these first two verses is clear. It's uh, sex is given to be enjoyed uh, within a, a marriage situation between a man and a woman. That's the context with which the gift is given. This is considered to be the first marriage. The Adam and Eve committed to one another in marriage. We actually see that in Genesis 2 where it talks about this is why a man leaves his uh, mother and father and the, and the two become one. So it's, it's referencing a marriage. And so uh, what we're learning right now is it's a gift of procreation. It's a gift of intimacy, but it's only enjoyed within the confines by which the gift was given, which is between a man and a woman in a committed relationship of a marriage. And so as we unpack this um, intimacy aspect, um, we begin to see that one of the coolest parts um, about 
sex is that it allows for people to be known in a way that, that they can't necessarily be known outside of that. It's, it's a gift where intimacy can be enjoyed like in this really unique and beautiful way that actually reflects the intimacy that God has within his own community, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's the intimacy that it, that it points to. And, and what I love about um, this, this particular passage is that in the garden before sin entered, um, they, they were having sex, it, they were having babies, but they were having sex without shame, without shame. They were both naked and they were unashamed. And, and really that, that, that's both literally, but also that also means like they, they knew one another and accepted one another. You know, I think it's Keller that writes about um, there's a couple of dangers here when it comes to shame. You can be not known and loved, and that's pretty shallow. Or you can be known and then not loved, and that's devastating. But to be fully known and fully loved, that's the gospel. That's, that's how God meets us. And, and as you begin to see sex in this way, sex is this gift where that type of high-level intimacy can begin to be experienced between one another that reminds people that we serve a God of intimacy that can be known through Jesus. The third um, aspect of this particular um, gift is it's a gift of pleasure. It's a gift of pleasure. Uh, if you've never read uh, the book Song of Solomon, you like never heard, you're like, you know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but you're like Song of Solomon, you're not really like, that's, that's new territory for you, read it. Like I really encourage you to read it. It has, two, has like two meetings. There's, it's allegorical, so it's, it's got this um, man and a woman, and um, they're within this confines of, of a marriage, and they're, they're pursuing one another, and they're enjoying this beautiful sex, this, this beautiful pursuit of one another, this beautiful um, um, journey of knowing one another in this intimate way. But it also reminds us of how God pursues us and how God knows us and how we have our deepest desires and delights met in Jesus. And so um, Song of Solomon verses, uh, ver chapter seven, verse six says, how beautiful and pleasant you are, O loved one, with all your delights. So he's looking at her and he's like, man, like you're just so delightful. I, I, I love to, um, to, to be with you. I love, as, as you read Song of Solomon, it's like, I love to drink deeply of you. It's like I can't get enough of you in this like really beautiful and romantic way. And there's deep delight and pleasure that's happening because the gift is being enjoyed in the context in which it was given. And we start to learn from this particular aspect of the gift that we serve a God of pleasure. Like this is a gift that's not only for populating the world and, and continuing life. It's not only a gift where we um, know one another in deeper and more intimate levels. It's actually a gift that we enjoy. Like, like for enjoyment's sake, those things not put to, to the side, but in addition to those things, we serve a God who wants us to drink deeply of one another because it actually points us to our greatest desire which is met in Jesus. And so as we flesh out this um, sort of delight aspect, commentator David Guzik goes into us, uh, he's writing about this verse, and he talks about um, just some of the, I mean, differences between animals and humans. And he's making the point that, like, if, if you don't, if you're not really buying this, this aspect that there's a serious pleasure like principle in, in our sexuality. Um, he, just, he just explores the difference between like animals and humans as it pertains to sex. And he's like, animals usually have sex for procreation. Animals have sex during particular seasons. Animals don't have secondary sexual organs and things like that. And he, and he goes on and he's like, and you, you read it and you're like, yeah, <laughs> like yes to what this guy's saying. I can buy into that. And it reminds you that sex is about pleasure. But now here's the deal, and we're going to talk about how some of these things get distorted in just a minute. Sex is not just about the pleasure you receive. Sex is about the pleasure you give in a selfless marriage. Um, we're going to uh, keep continuing. Uh, it, what else is it a gift of? It's a gift of protection. It's a gift of protection. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 7 to 5, it says this, do not deprive one another. And um, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. Now, now, the church in Corinth, it was a pretty sex-crazed environment. Um, it, you know, we, you might think that we live in a sex-crazed environment, but like this was, 
crazy, like, like temples for it and all those sort of things. And, um, and so Paul addresses it head on. And he's like, listen, don't deprive one another, um, except for if you're going to take some time to pray and maybe fast and do some intentional seeking of me, but then come back together. Why? So that Satan may not tempt you. It's like there's a protective nature to sex, which, which helps us. Why? Because the struggle is real. The struggle is real. And I'm not just talking about for guys. You know, the, like, the, if you look at the numbers and the statistics, whether it's in pornography or just, just like sexual brokenness, you're going to see that the struggle is real on both sides of this equation, men and women. And there is a protective nature when we are regularly giving ourselves over to this act because it's a, it, it provides some protection to where we might wander off potentially without it. Now, that doesn't excuse bad behavior. It, it's not a, a silver bullet that cures everything. It's not like, well, if I have sex with my, if, if I have sex with my wife, well, that's going to cure my pornography addiction. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. But we can't miss the fact that God has given us sex for children, for life, for intimacy, for pleasure, for deep, deep pleasure, and for protection. This is a, there's a protective nature to our sexual union, and so we should know that that's part of how the gift operates. And as I think about this, I'm, I'm reminded that, that our God is the God of protection. And it reminds us that our greatest protection and our greatest refuge is found in the person of Jesus. And so um, as, as we kind of explore this, it kind of, there's, there's, a, there's a head that comes to, to battle here, right? There's, a, there's some tension um, that might may be even in the room right now. And there's some tension that like you've probably experienced with this. And, and one of the tensions is our way versus God's way. Our way versus God's way. You see, it's God's way to give good gifts that ultimately point to the one good gift, Jesus. It's God's way to give good gifts, whatever they may be, food, sex, clothing, shelter, music. It's God's way to give good gifts that ultimately, as you enjoy them in the right context, point to the one good gift of Jesus. It's our way, though, to take those good gifts and try to fulfill ourselves with them. It's like we get stuck on the gift and never get to the giver. And the scripture calls that an idol. And that's where we end up serving and worshiping idols. And an idol is something that over promises and under delivers. And oftentimes we can do that in this particular topic as it pertains to sex. And so let's take a little bit of a look at sex in today's world, in sex in a fallen world. So we see that this is the intent of God as the gift. And, and how is some of this stuff um, being played out? Well, um, important to note, like in, in, the, in the understanding of Scripture, that uh, our original um, creation came without sin, like without brokenness. And then the, the sin of Adam and Eve, it wasn't eating like something that was off a divine diet. It was not believing God. It was doing what I just said. It was taking the good gifts of God and basically not believing that they led to God. It was getting stuck on the gift. And so they were like, okay, God, I hear what you're saying, but I just, I don't believe that my ultimate fulfillment can be found in you, so I'm gonna look for it in your gifts. And that, the root of that sin was, was pride, but it was unbelief. It was not believing who God is. And now we enter into a world today that has suffered from that same unbelief. We actually don't believe in our heart of hearts that the gift is given for these purposes. We doubt just like Adam and Eve. And just like Adam and Eve, we take up our own causes and our own will, and we oftentimes get stuck at the gift rather than the giver. And what, what does that look like? Well, well, a couple of things here that, that we have listed. And um, we can see this is kind of sex in, in today's world. I think we've got a list of them. We've got, we've got life and intimacy, pleasure and protection. How are, how are some of these things distorted uh, because, of, because of our sin? Well, as it pertains to life, we see that there's, there's sometimes two distortions. There there's, can be more, obviously, but there's some distortions as it pertains to um, like how we 
understands like God's gift of life. And there are, there are times when, when uh, we engage in sex, life is created. That life looks like it's going to be an inconvenience for us. It's an unwanted life. We will do away with that life. We will abort that life. That's one of the distortions when we are stuck on, on not believing God and not believing that, that our ultimate goodness is found in him, we then take control of our lives and we start eliminating things that we feel will, will not be best for us. One of the other distortions is almost on the other side of that where, where we allow the, the children and the life that is a result of sex to actually become thieves of further sex. So, so this kind of taking you from, from one aspect of distortion to another, where, where now you have children, you've got two, three children, like it's been part of the gift, but you quit trying at home. You like quit, quit trying to win your wife because you're so busy winning your kids, and, and like your marriage begins to suffer and the gift begins to deteriorate because you've allowed part of the product of the gift to steal your attention away from continuing to use this and enjoy this how God has designed it. Well, what about um, intimacy? What are some of the distortions there? Well, easy hookups, right? Like, like sex has be become such a casual thing that we just hook up here, we hook up there. And, um, you know, it, it's almost as if we have a longing for intimacy, although we probably wouldn't call it that. And, and we're super casual about where we might find it. And so we just go from one thing to another to another. Uh, another distortion here is, is neediness. It's like um, some of us might be in a place of brokenness where, you know, it's easy. So we just we, we move from one person to another. Other, others of us uh, become inc incredibly needy. And so what we do is we understand God's design for it. We understand the gifted nature of it. But we're like thinking it's not coming soon enough or in the way that I want it to. So I'm going to compromise what I know to be true about who God is because I just have this need to be intimate with someone. And, and, and so we begin to look to another person to fulfill what only Jesus can fulfill, and sex becomes a part of that. Incredible neediness and codependency there. And not just here, but if we look at that particular area, this is where we begin to see some like real shame that's hard to, uh, to undo. And that's sometimes because of what we've done. The second thing is, uh, or this third thing is, is a lot of times what's been done to us, and it's pleasure. In the area of pleasure, what are some of the distortions of pleasure? Well, um, one, of the, one of the main distortions of pleasure is pornography. It is an incredibly potent industry. I was at um, this leadership conference last week, and I think the stat was right. So, uh, this, this woman who was giving a talk said something to the degree of, like, six in ten guys look at pornography every week. crazy distortion of pleasure when it comes to pornography. And we see people flocking to that. Well, because they've pretty much given up in some degree, at least on the first two aspects of the gift, and at least now they're going to try to cash in on the pleasure aspect. To what expense? So what expense? Well, when that plays out and you try to bring that back into other relationships, you get things like, man, it's just never enough. It's never good enough. It's never um, like you thought it would be. Your expectations are radically distorted. And that not only hurts the people that you've supported in the industry by watching it, who are dying young deaths because they're giving their life for your pleasure, but it also brings decay and deterioration into your home. That takes oftentimes years to be undone. A lot of times one of the fuel, one of the, one of the gases for sexual abuse is pornography. It's people who have watched pornography, people who have been um, affected by that industry who, who now are going out, acting out on some of the things that have, have um, really come in and corrupted their heart and mind. And so shame again comes to you, not of any of your own doing, but of what has been done to you. And that's something that, that you bring in to further relationships as a victim. 
The last, last thing here is, is protection. Where does it get distorted in protection? Well, I mentioned abuse and, and what should be protective about sex is oftentimes abused by those who are, have some authority or have some power um, that you expected to protect you and now all of a sudden you're uh, a victim of their abuse. But it also comes out in manipulation and control. Um, oftentimes, well, you know, there, there's, there could be a marriage where you, know, you, you understand that sex is not, you're not supposed to deprive one another but you begin using sex in order to manipulate your spouse or con to control them. That's a ramification of sex in our broken world today. Instead of it being protective, you're now using it um, to get what you want. See, all of these things, they actually point to what we would call redemptive longings. Redemptive longings. There's, there's, Mitch talked about it last week. There, there are these places in our heart that long for what only Jesus can fulfill. Life, intimacy, pleasure, protection, like we all have these longings. And when we look to the gift to give us the ultimate fulfillment of those things, man, we all suffer. But the cool part about it is that Jesus changes everything. Like every one of the messages in this particular, you know, series has been that like Jesus at that, in that particular topic, he changes everything. He doesn't change the desire or the, the intent of the gift, but he changes everything everything. And, and just as we kind of close, what, what is it that he changes? He does a couple of things. And um, we're going we're gonna to close here in just a minute. We're going to have some, some prayer partners up front. And um, they're going to they, they're gonna be asked to pray some of these things into your life. Here's some of the things that Jesus does as he changes things. First of all, he fulfills our longings. Jesus fulfills our longings. He's the one that fulfills what your heart is wandering for and, and prone to, to look elsewhere for. Only Jesus can fulfill that. You see, because as I shared with you before, we live in a broken world, but God, God doesn't leave it broken. Like any good parent, when he sees people hurting, he sees people in shame, he sees people being abused, he has done something about it, and he sent God the Son, Christ. And Christ went to a cross, and on that cross, with no sin of his own, he took your sin and he took my sin. And he was punished in our place. He died our death. And on the third day, listen, don't miss this. He overcame your sin. He overcame your death. He overcame your personal brokenness that would separate you from God. But he also, because of the cosmic nature of his death and resurrection, has power to bring healing to the brokenness you've experienced from others, to the brokenness you bring in from poor decisions, to the longing in your heart that you've always looked elsewhere for. Man, Jesus fulfills that. What else does he do? Jesus heals our brokenness. I told you as we started out, like I think that some of you like, need to experience healing. And sometimes Jesus does this through a journey and through a process, and sometimes Jesus does it through a moment, and sometimes it's both. But I would encourage you, if there's any kind of healing where, where you just, you need Jesus to come in and touch an area of shame and brokenness that nobody else has been able to touch, I would invite you to come and be prayed over and just ask, just be like, I need Jesus, I need Jesus to heal me. And that's all you need to say. You can share more if you want, but I just, I need Jesus to heal me. And we're just gonna believe that Jesus is gonna bring some healing that you've never experienced before. He loves to do that. Jesus, what else does he do? He redeems our identity. He redeems our identity and he makes it so that we don't overemphasize or underemphasize our identity. Listen, biblically, our identity is not found in our sexuality. Our identity is found in the fact that we are sons and daughters when we place our faith and trust in Jesus and his finished work on our behalf. When we turn from our sin and trust Jesus as our savior and say, Jesus, I'm, I'm, you're now what I've got. I'm betting it all on you. Let's do this. When you come to him by faith, he now makes you a son or a daughter. That is your identity. And it allows you to not over or underestimate other secondary identities. One of the things I want to say as we close is um, singles. It's like I'm talking about this gift of sex. I'm talking about the context of it. And it's like, yeah, but what about me? Like, does that mean that I don't get any of this? Because what you've said is it's in the context of marriage. And if I'm not married or that's like, 
remember, Jesus is our gift. These are secondary gifts that lead to Jesus. His healing, his transformation, his redeeming your identity, his fulfilling your longing. Sex is another one of those gifts, like food, shelter, whatever it might be, that leads to the greater gift. So I want to encourage you to continue to look to Jesus while also valuing the fact that it's really difficult and painful and sometimes overwhelming as you wait. It does not diminish the weight and the difficulty of not having one of these secondary gifts that leads to him. One of the greatest gifts that we can give our singles is to be a, a warm and hospitable community because people experience intimacy. People experience healing. People experience transformation, not in isolation, but in community. So married people, we have got to open our homes over and over and over again. And singles, you have got to allow us to do this as a family or we will be hurting and we will miss out on what Jesus wants to bring. The last thing I need to tell you is this, because I want to be a church that celebrates Jesus in our sexuality. Like I want that to be true of us. We've got to make it about Jesus. So one of the last things that Jesus does is he transforms our posture towards those who disagree with us. He transforms our posture to those who don't see sex in the same context and in the same light that we've just explained. To those who don't have a biblical perspective on sex, to those who have a different perspective on the man and the woman and the marriage and all that, Jesus transforms our posture toward them. He doesn't transform the truth. He transforms our posture. And the story that the Lord put on my heart last night was when this woman is caught in this sexual sin and Jesus, he like, he protects her, he engages her, he meets her where she is, and by love, he invites her to something different. Let's be transformed by that posture where we always bring it back and make it about Jesus. Because sex is a Jesus issue, it's not a sex issue. It always comes back to the person of Jesus. So as we dialogue and as we love those who are different than us, who disagree with us, let's walk lovingly with them and continue to point them back, yes to truth, yes to the biblical design, but most of all to the person of Jesus because he brings the healing, he brings transformation, he brings re redemption, not our greatest arguments. I'm gonna ask our prayer partners to come and um, if you'll come forward here and come to my left and your right and we're gonna um, just, we're gonna play some music behind me here and I'm gonna pray over you guys and, and ask the Lord's blessing to be upon you and, and we're gonna trust that some of you maybe need, just kinda need to stay and allow the last two courses of, of this song to, to wash over you and some of you need to come and be prayed over and, and just ask the Lord to bring about a newness that maybe the Lord's never, yeah, you guys can come, that maybe the Lord's never brought before and uh, we're gonna trust that the Lord's gonna meet us here in this moment. So as I pray, we'll be officially dismissed, but, but we're going we're gonna to keep it in this, in this moment for those of you who, who need to encounter the God that loves you as you are and wants to bring healing and transformation. Let's stand for prayer. Father, in this moment, we're trusting that the preaching of your word, the declaration of your gospel, the love of your spirit and the presence of Jesus would bring about things and would bring about life. Lord, that maybe has never been here before. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and you would fill this moment 
that we would be surrendered to you and to the work that you want to do in us and through us and with those that we engage outside of this moment. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come and be the healer and the giver of hope that you are. We love you and we worship you. And now we receive a benediction. May the God of life and intimacy, may the God of pleasure and protection give you Jesus over and over and over again. Amen. Love you guys. See you next week.